waiting. He should be joining in a second. There he is, M K. How are we, brother? I'm good. I I wish you didn't have that hat on so we could have a look at that uh, latest trim of yours. You know what? If I'm feeling confident enough, I'll uh, I'll take it off towards the back end of the video. But it's uh, <laughs> not very special. You won't be impressed. Um, how's everything going, boy? It looks like it's a beautiful day out there. No sky, no clouds in the sky, just uh, pure blue. Yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty stock standard uh, Southern California day here. Um, so I think probably today we'll hit a few balls and obviously talk to you a little bit and uh, catch a few more rays. That's the way, boy. That's the way. And on, on that, is that what you've been doing with the um, during isolation? I guess you, you're lucky to have a cricket net in your your back garden. You've just been smashing up balls. I've been watching loads of your videos. And um, I was to watch one this morning where you actually got pinned. You got pinned in a bit of an uncomfortable position. Didn't look very nice. Yeah, it's, it's not the only time I've been pinned, but um, not always caught on camera. But uh, those uh, bowling machine balls, they definitely sting when they get you. But the bowling machine, the one I've got is pretty cool because it, it, it varies it a lot. It's not supposed to, but it keeps it realistic. So every now and then it spits one out that's like 20K quick. <laughs> and I was practicing these pull shots and it just shoots on through and then boom. Jeepers. <laughs> laugh, and that put the end to my three-hour session. <laughs> no way, well, that looks quality. I wish I had a bowling machine here, but um, obviously living in England, we've limited the space, so we, we don't get too much space to use. But um, I've yeah, been keeping myself busy with videos as well. I've been loving your videos, by the way. Um, if you guys want to go check out Marty's videos, they are awesome. It's just all um, cricket coaching, just going through different shots and uh, getting a real insight into the way he goes about his training. And also just tips, very good tips here in there as well, which is going to help you know those youngsters um, and cricketers, young and old, never mind youngsters, old blokes as well. Um, so, Marty, obviously, it's really cool to have you here today. Um, you know, it's a great opportunity to um, for people to get an insight into your career and uh, also your kind of career going into the coaching world um, because you've obviously, you know, turned a new leaf, which is really, really, really exciting. Um, people will probably want to know how we how we first met. Uh, would you like to take it away? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, we played a season together in Manchester at Duckingfield, um, lived together uh, with Johnny, Johnny Gascoigne, legend, took us both in. Um, he probably didn't really know what it, what had hit him when we first turned up, um, but he basically taken on board young Chris Marrow, who had the maturity of about a 12-year-old, <laughs> and then some Kiwi who was a bit silly. Um, so I took on the role of babysitting young Chris and and Johnny basically managed the both of us um, tried to keep us a little bit calm but we're both a little bit hyperactive so a lot of energy ended up in Johnny's house and uh, he managed it beautifully it might have taken him a bit of time to work us out but um, I think we had a great six months at Duckenfield um, a, a great club in Manchester obviously if anyone's looking at finding a club, there's some great bunch of guys there, lovely ground, um, and we had a really successful season that year, so um, certainly won't forget those six months um, babysitting Chris <laughs> and living with the mighty Johnny Gascoigne. Unbelievable. No, it was incredible. And, um, yeah, I was I was obviously 18 at the time. You were about 63, 63, 64? You're hitting 17 now, aren't you? So, yeah, it was a little bit... <laughs> no, I think so was... Uh, my birth certificate said I was 25, but um, <laughs> I was probably acting about 55 at the time, uh, but moving athletically like an 18-year-old. Oh, oh, man. I mean, that was, yeah, like you said, special, special year. Um, yeah, coming over as an 18-year-old, it was obviously really, like, scary. And uh, having an experienced uh, professional like yourself, that just made life so easy for me. And I think... With that club as well, just looking at Duck and Field, uh, we played in what was called the Lancashire County League at the time. And I think now that's changed to the um, Greater Manchester League. Um, so a, a good standard of cricket. Uh, you know, it was good club cricket and we came across some good teams, some good professionals. And um, having you there, I think the club really benefited from it. I think I can speak on behalf of them when I say uh, you were great overseas, both on the field and off the field. And um, the first thing I want to touch on was this was um, your leadership abilities. So 
you weren't given the role as the as the captain. Um, and I'm not sure if you have captain any teams in the past. Uh, but as a leader, um, you were fantastic. People kind of followed your footsteps. Um, they they trusted you. Uh, you led by example. And um, yeah, it was fantastic. And as a youngster, again, like I'm saying, it was just awesome to look up to. And um, yeah, you, you kind of set that bar and everyone wanted to reach that bar. So just on that, um, is that something you've always kind of had? Um, you know, as, as a cricketer, have you always been able to, to lead a group very well? And uh, have you had any kind of roles as a captain in the past? Yeah, sure. So I think... Um... Obviously, leadership comes with time, and it also comes with experience. And I was I played under some really great captains, um, and also spent some really good time with some um, great mental skills coaches and stuff like that. And I certainly have coached, um, sorry, captain a few teams in my time. Um, but I think the the biggest thing as a coach is is trust and and leading by example. So. If, if you've got 11 guys that trust you and, and they know their roles and, and you've given them freedom to play that way and there's not consequences to someone trying to execute and, and doing their best, then people can just go out there and express themselves versus telling them they must do something and they must score this amount or they must do that, which is really not what you can do. Um, but giving them the trust to go and try to execute their role and if you've got 11 guys doing that, you're going to have a good team culture and a good trust factor. And some days, some guys are not going to come off and some some days the others will come off. So if you've got 11 guys geared to doing the same thing and with their certain roles, then you're going to have a pretty successful team. Um, I haven't once played in a team with a, with a poor culture that's done well. Um, so I think for me, I'll take guys with um, good attitudes and willingness to learn and unselfishness over guys with high skill any day and if you give me someone with a lot of skill and they don't have the right attitude and and are selfish I'll show them the door right away and I'm not interested um, because it doesn't help young guys grow Um, they might win you a match or two on their own but the rest of the time they'll bring you down um, they'll limit the development from young guys Um, so I think it's about trusting trusting the leader and not putting anyone on a pedestal. Um, you've got 11 guys. If you've got 11 guys just doing their best and, and giving them that role, you've got a good chance to win a lot of games and you've got a good chance to have a great time. And if you're having a great time, you'll win matches. Um, so I think that's the key for me. Um, and obviously work, at, work ethic and routines are uh, critical um, to build that team culture as well. Um, but we had, a, we had a very unique bunch of guys at, at Duck and Field, in fact, and and guys, some guys with a little bit of eagles, ego, some guys a little bit of sulking here and there. But in general, if if you create that culture, those things are minimized a bit. Look, everyone's still going to have their own personalities and stuff, but if you can manage it and, and they're all on focus on team outcomes, not their personal outcomes, then, then you have a lot of fun and you minimize those maybe weaknesses and stuff of, of some people within the team. Yeah. No, that's, yeah, 100%. And I think um, just from listening to what you said there, it's, it's, again, it comes down to almost that positive kind of positivity. It's just having a positive mindset in your approach um, and also just trying to create that positive atmosphere within the group. And I think that's, um, that brings people on board on the same page, everyone working together. Um, and that's something I really want to touch on a little bit later in this uh, interview with you, just uh, looking at positive mindset. But just going back to... Um, you know, when we first met and just a bit of an introduction, I've got a few funny stories that uh, I'd love to tell the listeners. So picture this. Um, so I slept in a single bedroom um, and it was next door to Marty's. Uh, it was very thin walls, so I could pretty much hear everything that was going on. And then our housemate uh, who put us up, Johnny Gaslin, he slept in the room next to Marty's. Uh, again, he was um, really, it was really thin walls, so you could literally hear every single thing. And so I remember uh, one night, Johnny, uh, excuse me for saying this, Johnny, but uh, he used to snore quite heavily. And um, I remember just listening to him snore. And I'm sitting in my room, and he's like, oh, my God, when's this guy going to shut up? And then next thing I hear, I just hear shoes being thrown against the wall. And uh, <laughs> you were just launching your shoes right at Johnny's, like, wall. It was the most hilarious thing ever. I don't think I've laughed so much in my life. Um, but, like, little things like that was quality. And I remember... 
this is a little bit of a rude one, but um, walking into your bedroom and I was just typical 18 year old, just trying to cause trouble. And um, I think I was, I don't know, I think I was farting in your bedroom or something, just being silly. And I think uh, you told me next time I fart in your bedroom, you're going to punch me. And so I did it. And then I remember you literally came into my room and you just whacked me full on. And <laughs> it's just memories like that, man. I'll never forget. And it was just quality. And Oh, man, what a time that was. Um, I don't know if you have any memories that you remember that you can remind me of. Um, anything that comes to mind? Um, I think probably <laughs> one night when we had a night out um, after a game, we uh, we got back at like three or four in the morning. Uh, um, and I believe we must have lost the house key on the night out. So we oh, yeah. we um, <laughs> we had to sleep on the uh, back patio and it was like <laughs> bright light. Um, and, like, and I and I remember just Johnny just being he was just always so disappointed in our behaviour. And I just remember he was just disgraced by us sleeping on the patio. And then the amount of the time you left his house unlocked in the middle of oh, duck and field was ridiculous and his discipline levels and I didn't leave that door unlocked once <laughs> and um just trying to baby for you to make sure Johnny wasn't too pissed off was just oh, no. difficult it was a joke yeah I think there was, there was too much chaos caused there but anyway that was that that was a couple of years ago life moved on we both grown up um but yeah quality quality time um now, moving on to more serious stuff. Um, so, just, just quietly before we move on from the Duck and Field uh, topic, Marty, um, I've never played in a game where a person has taken 10 wickets in a game. Uh, Marty did that. That was one of the most incredible things I've seen in, in cricket. Uh, I think he played against a team called Denton St. Lawrence, and he literally took all 10 wickets. Um, and I'll, I'm a keeper, so obviously standing on the stump. Got an opportunity to see that. That was incredible. And I just wanted to mention that as well, because that's not something that you hear every single day. So... That was pretty awesome. Um, but yeah, so moving on to the more kind of serious topics and uh, diving more into your career um, as a cricketer. So starting with the pro cricketing career. So you've obviously played a lot of professional cricket in New Zealand for Central District as well as Canterbury. Just with those two teams, um, obviously had a look at your stats, uh, your preferred format. What is it that you prefer playing? Do you prefer the white ball cricket? Do you prefer red ball cricket? What's more your game? Yeah, I mean, I was, I was better at um, 20, 20, 50 overs, so probably my preference. But at the same time, I I loved Red Bull cricket as well. I, I just wasn't that good at it, to be honest. Um, from a bowling perspective, I, I was much more efficient at, and at trying to reduce runs opposed to take wickets. Yep. Um, so while I really enjoyed Red Bull, I, I wasn't a big threat, to be honest. Um, so bowling with those attacking fields and stuff like that, it, it was difficult for me. And it's something I always wanted to do, but um, I, I worked and worked and worked, and, and I just didn't get there. Um, so probably, yeah, 2020 and, and 50 over, this was much more suited to me. So therefore, I probably enjoyed playing those formats more um, where I could bowl um, and try to minimize the damage and stuff like that opposed to try force taking wickets um and also from a batting perspective i enjoyed um playing fairly aggressively and and that so it was suited to me um but love love all the formats to be honest i wouldn't i wouldn't put any on the pedestal um yeah. love watching test cricket love playing four day no i didn't play much four day cricket but red bull cricket maybe three day cricket and stuff like that love that love the camaraderie and and the the time it, it takes out there to, to build wickets and stuff like that. But definitely 20, 20 and 50 over is what I played a hell of a lot more of. Yep, yep. And um, I guess that works in your favour as well with your unique action. Um, so Marty's a left-arm orthodox. Um, sorry, I'm a, yeah, left-arm orthodox. I'm orthodox. Um, and yeah, he was uh, he had a very special kind of action. Um, I mean, we obviously can't show it on camera, but uh, I guess that obviously works in your favour. Just bringing that kind of X factor to the game. Um, and I guess that more and more these days, uh, when we look at world cricket, uh, players who do things differently, uh, the likes of Jasper Bumra, um, you know, Stephen Smith with his batting, I think these guys are starting to kind of um, you know, become more and more relevant and uh, almost like a, a bit of a, uh, a star, really, a star in the, in the dust kind of thing. They, people are, are kind of looking for people with the X-Factor, and uh, you obviously had that with your spin bowling. 
Um, and how did that come about? Were you just always um, kind of, did you always have that action growing up or was it something that you worked on and developed uh, to try and be different or quite a tricky question on that? No, yeah. it, it actually came about, it probably came about when I was like 16, 17. Um, early on, I bowled with a, a fairly classical left arm orthodox action and um, I, I really don't know what happened um, and it just happened. Um, did I want that? No, not necessarily, but was I going to... I just worked with whatever my body did, essentially. I didn't try to do this or try to do that. I just let my body do it, and eventually it started doing this. And it was good in a unique way because it's harder for people to get their rhythm because um, they sort of hold it back and then sling it forward. So for people to quite get their batting rhythm was not as simple. Um, but at the same time, it was very difficult um, to ma- maintain consistency so I had to bowl a lot to maintain consistency with that action it wasn't one of those things where someone could chuck me a ball after a month and I can just run in and put it on the spot yeah I had to bowl a lot and a lot and a lot a lot and it, it obviously killed my back and my hips and stuff like that so there were certainly some challenges to bowling with such a unique action um, but at the same time it, it's what my body wanted to do so I'd prefer it just to naturally do its thing um and for me, when I was in rhythm, it just felt completely normal. Um, so it, it was it was good in the sense that it was harder to pick up, um, but it was tough in the sense I had to bowl so much to maintain that consistency so I could perform it at the higher level. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I know. It was um, yeah, awesome to watch. I obviously watched a few little clips of you playing. Um, I remember being in South Africa, waking up at like, I don't know what time it was. It was really, really early in the morning and, and watching you during, was it called the, the Georgie Pie? Um, T- yeah, it's probably called the Georgie Pie. Yeah, yeah. No, and that was awesome. Yeah. Uh, watching you play a couple of uh, switch hits and all that kind of stuff as well, which was brilliant. Um, really, really, obviously, the pro career, you played 35 list day games, I think close to 40 20 20 games, as well as a couple of first off games. Obviously, within that time frame, there's a lot of cricket and that's a lot of years of professional cricket. Um, best memories? Anything that sticks out for you? Anything that you really, really enjoyed? Yeah, I mean, probably the first um, 50 over final we won um, against Auckland. Um, I think we needed like 60 to win um, with five overs to go or something, two wickets in hand, and basically it was game over. It, I mean, it was myself and Michael Mason, um, whose highest score previously was 20 in, in first class career, and he'd be playing for like 10 years or whatever. So um, that one was pretty cool. Um, we somehow brought that one home. Auckland had basically shaken hands and taken the trophy before we came out to bat. And then Michael Mason ended up scoring 40, which doubled his highest score um, in the history of his career. And that was his last game as well. So to score 40 and bring the lads home was pretty cool. And to be out there, part of that partnership was, was excellent. So that memory um, is right up there. But... I the whole the whole career is a memory. Like it was just fun. Everything was fun. It didn't matter who I played for, what what level of cricket. Just to be around guys and 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 have fun and and try win those moments. Um, but with a smile on the face was was, it's just all good memories. There's, there's too many um, to to single out, and there's so many more to come. So. It's all good stuff, in my opinion. Yeah, no, that's awesome, and that's that's why we play cricket, right? For the memories, for the fun of it, and uh, yeah, just for the enjoyment. And and that literally brings me on to the next point that I wanted to talk about, um, perfectly. And um, it was interesting because I was doing a little bit of research earlier today, um, because I was speaking to a mate of mine, and we we both agreed that every person that we've met from New Zealand just seems to be really really positive, uh, really happy. And so I did a bit of research, and I literally typed into Google. Um, you know, why are, why are people from New Zealand so happy? And it came up with this uh, article, and it was about um, the government putting uh, money into to mental health. And uh, I think $2 billion um, was put towards mental health in 2019, um, which, is, which is massive, and it's, um, it's obviously only going to help. So I think from having played with you um, and also several other guys from New Zealand, I've, I've noticed that you are very, very happy and very positive. Um, and, and why is that? I know that? Again, that's a really, really hard question, but why 
why do you guys seem to come across as just really, really happy people, really positive? And, and with playing sports and cricket, uh, for example, like you seem to be playing with positivity and, and, and happiness and no fear of failure. Why is that? Was there something in the upbringing um, with your kind of regional cricket or how, how did that come about? And what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I think you um, need to be a little bit careful with that because New Zealand actually has one of the highest suicide rates. Um, so while okay. sometimes it may look like everyone's happy and stuff, yeah, uh, New Zealand's are quite reserved people at times, so you may not see exactly what's going on okay. deeper. Um, and there's still a bit of a rugby mentality, which means you don't tell people how you feel and, and stuff like that. So I think... Okay. Um, it's still a huge work in progress for New Zealand and, and I, I know they're pumping a lot of money into it and trying to have these conversations and role models are speaking out more about um, depression and, and stuff like that, which is awesome. It's, it's a huge, huge topic for discussion in New Zealand. But from a sporting perspective, I think um, the All Blacks have, have led from the front. Um, these guys are like kings in New Zealand, but they act like just regular people um they, they're great guys um they're so focused on on team outcomes and not individual um and i think it stems from an unselfishness of looking after your mate before you look after yourself um these guys are just great 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 guys i mean they sweep their own shit um they're the most imp- important people in new zealand but they'll have a conversation with anyone they don't put themselves on a pedestal um, so I think that's important because everyone looks up to the All Blacks in New Zealand and um, they set an incredible um, level of professionalism and, and being good people, I think, is more important than anything. Um, in fact, I'd go as far as saying, like, if you're not a great person, there's a huge chance you won't be looked at for selection in those higher teams. Um, so another another reason for the, the mentality, I think, in New Zealand um, there's some incredible sports sports sites. Um, I've worked closely with John Quinn and Gary Hermanson, um, who have worked a lot with um, the the Olympics, Olympics New Zealand. They work for the Black Caps, All Blacks, etc. Um, these guys are incredible sports sites, um, and the guys that are willing to open up and be part of that new era where mental skills is important. These guys have so much knowledge. Um, and they really do take the emphasis away from outcome-produced thinking to uh, process thinking. And that makes sports so much easier. If I'm a bowler and I'm not worried about getting hit for six or bowling this guy out, and all I'm worried about is, hey, this is what I'm trying to execute, um, focus on my breathing, and then just release and trust, the game becomes so much more easy. Because if I'm always trying to control that outcome down the other end of, oh, is he going to hit me for four? I can't. And it's going to cook my brain really quickly. So if I can simplify the game to just process and what I can control, this game becomes easier and then the outcomes come. Um, so there's a lot of emphasis on that in New Zealand cricket especially. Yeah. And I think this is why you see, you see the black caps. They don't have half the potential of, Australia, England, India, but on the world stage, when it comes to the World Cup, they're always there. Yeah. Because they are not over pumping up for the situation. They're not worried about what the nation thinks. They're not pumping pressure on themselves. They're just going out there and doing what they do. And they're doing it with a smile on the big stage. You'll see other teams, you can see and feel the tenseness of some teams in those big stages. Um, because they feel the expectation, their mindset's focused on, we must win the World Cup. But if we must win the World Cup, how's that going to happen by just saying that? There's a lot that's got to happen, just simplifying it. And I think the New Zealanders do that really well, and they are just trying to win each ball at a time. They're not looking down the path. Um, And that's why I think they perform, in my opinion, way above where they should be, way above. Because um, of the mental skills. Yeah, with with a country of four million people, I think that's the population in New Zealand, right? Or run about four million. Well, I think it might be closer to five now, if not five. Yeah, it's it's incredible how well they do not only obviously on the rugby and the cricket field, but hockey and netball and there's there's so many sports where they are 
um, you know, one of the best in the world, which is incredible for the size of the population. And I like how you say, um, you know, back going back to cricket, if you were to simplify the game and the fact that they told you that just to, by simplifying it, it's going to be a lot easier. And it does make sense. Um, a batter's job in cricket is to try and score runs, not to hit the ball through extra cover on the front foot to make sure the weight's forward. It's just simplify. If you simplify everything, I think um, life is easier. That's why I try and teach my kids uh, that I coach. Um, I say, just simplify. You're a batter. Just try to score runs. It's the best that you're a bowler. Try and land the ball in a good area. Um, and yeah, I think not putting too much information behind the actual task is, is often the best way forward. Um, and, and as you said, with the, the people from New Zealand as well, I remember, uh, again, going back to Manchester, uh, we met up with um, Ken Williamson for coffee. You know, as a an 18 year old, if I was to, you know, one of, like, I don't know, I'm just throwing a name out there, but a South African cricketer, let's say, Jar Cullis Graham Smith, I would be absolutely petrified going to meet Jar Cullis or, or Graham Smith because, you know, it's someone that I idolize. And Ken Williamson is another person that, me and many other people idolized. But I remember walking into that coffee shop, he literally treated me just like his mate. You know, hey, how's it going, mate? Uh, good to see you. Can I grab your coffee? Like, it was just, I don't know. I, I just really have a lot of respect for, um, you know, for, for from the people from New Zealand, uh, just for that fact. And um, I think that's that's the way forward. I think that's how people should be. So, um, yeah, thanks for like touching on that. That's really, really interesting. Um, and also the mental health side of things as well. Um, yeah, it's fantastic. And then lastly, the big one. Um, you're currently in California. Um, tell us why. So why the move to the USA? Yeah. Obviously really, really exciting. Um, yeah, so let's start with the move. Why did you move out there? Uh, when did you move out there? Let's take from there. Yeah, so obviously, um, you as anyone knows as well, I met Andy when I was in Manchester and yep. my wife. Um, and I think we were maybe two weeks in and you said, you guys are going to get married. And we were like, <laughs> it's like <laughs> it was two weeks after I met her and we just cracked up and you, you popped out of the kitchen after cooking your stupid protein pancakes or whatever you were making <laughs> and said, oh, you're going to marry, you guys are going to get married. <laughs> we're just laughing like, yeah, whatever. And um, sure enough, we got, we did get married. We got married in the Midwest of the US and then we spent a year out in um, New Zealand while I was still playing. Yeah, and uh, then and Andy wanted to do a masters and whatever, um, so she applied to six schools out here in uh, the US and uh, fortunately got accepted into them. She's ridiculously smart. Yeah. Um, so San Diego was probably the the pick of the places out of all of the spots she was accepted, and um, I tried not to apply any pressure, but um, fortunately she chose San Diego, which is uh, an absolute Absolutely incredible city with ridiculous weather, um, yeah. amazing beaches, good food, and, and pretty good people. So that's how we ended up here. And um, I took a year out of doing anything cricket related, um, and then started coaching a few a few of the guys. Um, give, like uh, started off with four guys: Ishan, and then Maddo and, and Vinay from from memory, just just for fun and help the, these guys out. And um, yeah, things just skyrocket is like out of control um so then uh, a year on or whatever um i said to andy hey uh, can we uh can we buy a can we buy a house and put a net in the backyard and and i tend to i trust my instincts and i just felt good of them. It, it probably sounded ridiculous to people but i just trusted and i knew things were moving really well for me and um I felt like it was it was going to be a very positive move. Um, so we did this about six months ago, um, and before the lockdown, it was out of control the the amount of bookings um, and starting to travel around different places like Arizona and Vegas and LA to do some coaching courses with groups there and stuff like that. So um, going into the lockdown, I was I was pretty tired to be honest. Um, the the demand over here is just ridiculous there's so much cricket in the u.s um it's just unfortunate they haven't had the opportunity to have coaching and have facilities to train and stuff so i think if the u.s i know there's money around now and and i just hope that the right people are, are making those decisions with that money and facilities and coaching are heavily prioritized um and building up 
young players from the US because um, there's just a massive scope here. Um, and I'm really starting... My, my focus right now is the Southwest and helping like um, Arizona and, and Nevada and um, California and especially San Diego. I'm very passionate about San Diego cricket because there's massive numbers. They're great people. They have the they have the money um, and there's some big plans here. Um, and I've just loved coaching here because these guys are a lot of them um, from overseas or whatever and grew up didn't have the opportunity of coaching and stuff like that. A lot of education was highest priority and yeah. and now they sort of get to make their own decisions. Having access to coaching is, is just like a dream come true to them. So it inspires me and and I'm just fizzed up when I get out of bed in the morning to help these guys um, because often when you're in say the UK or New Zealand or whatever a lot of kids have had it too easy um, yeah. and it's like babysitting them because their discipline and their behaviour is not always the best um, but over here they're just so grateful so hungry that there's no part of coaching that babysitting which is really cool for me because um, yeah. I don't want to do that I don't if you don't want to be coached, I don't want your money. I don't want your time. I, I don't want to deal with you. I, I don't value that. Yeah. Um, so having guys that are very hungry to, to um, get training and get better and just absorb what I've got to say is, is just awesome. So, yeah, it's, it's been one step by the other. And um, my, my five-year goal is actually um, to hopefully buy a plot of land and um, – build a cricket ground and have a training facility on it where I can host oh, wow. games and training camp and stuff like that. So just always, um, I'm just hungry to just keep keep going and stuff like that. And it's just naturally happening. I'm, I mean, I'm not hustling. I, I don't want to hustle, but I, I work hard and, and yeah. just use my passion to, to grow things naturally. And, and I think if you be a good person, things just seem to work out. So that's, that's how we ended up here. And, it's it's really cool. Yeah, no, wow, that's incredible. And um, you can tell you're obviously very, very passionate about coaching and also giving back to um, the kind of younger generation and those cricketers that are all up and coming. And just with them um, being in America, I'm sure you've been exposed to a lot of um, young cricketers that haven't necessarily played a lot of cricket. So you're working with um, children that literally haven't potentially picked up a cricket bat. And is that a real good opportunity to almost shape cricketers in the direction that you think they should be going towards instead of, you know, having someone that has been previously coached and has been forced to go through the motions of getting into the net, do this, do that. And, um, yeah, I think it must be a fantastic opportunity having, you know, someone completely fresh, fresh mind to the game. And, and just literally it's almost like a bit of a project to, to kind of build them up and take them on the right path to playing um, the sport the way it should be played. Um, that must be fantastic. Yeah, I think so. I think um, I don't think so. There's much cricket within schools here yet. Um, I, I can't speak for the whole of the US because perhaps in some pockets there is. Um, but I think that would be a huge step. And um, I know there's money out there within the US Cricket Association and that. So I just hope it's used correctly and it starts at the bottom and getting into these schools because with the mass population and, and the finances, they could be very good at cricket. I think they're horribly underachieving at the moment considering yep. the amount of cricket in the U.S. and the opportunity here. Um, I feel like they should be one of the strongest uh, minor nations, but at the moment they're not. Um, so I think developing from the grassroots and heavy mass players from that younger age is, is critical. I think at the moment there's probably a huge um, huge part of the population in the US is, is a little bit older um, so waiting for their kids to come through and then push them um, into cricket um, but there's got to be, you got to dangle the cricket for those kids, there needs to be cricket in schools and, and maybe in colleges to give them something to aspire to because without that then it's like why would you play cricket when you can't even play games in the weekend and stuff like that so I think that's that's critical in building the numbers uh, amongst those schools and getting those young kids into it. Okay, well, no, that's yeah, that's. I mean, hopefully that is going to happen in the future. Uh, do you think? Can you see 
um, cricket taking place in schools. Can you think you think that's going to be something that will take place in your future in a couple of years? Or um... yeah, I'm not sure, mate. Like honestly, I've just put my head down and kind of done my own thing when I've got out here. Yeah. Um, I've heard some pretty horror stories um, historically with US cricket, so. I haven't been jumping out of my skin to get involved. Um, if something comes up where I can help them and assist with putting some coaching programs or yeah. and and assisting the game genuinely and maybe helping build the cricket in the southwest, I'll jump all over that. Um, but I've spent a lot of time focusing on my own business and San Diego itself and, and growing the game here and, and getting there. Um, but, yeah, it need, I think it needs to be a directive from the, the top um, to to get things moving from that end. So I don't know. A lot of people do ask about the ins and outs of US cricket. I, I actually do not know that much. I I know I've started a cricket business and it's absolutely flying. So I can tell you there's a heap of cricket here yeah. and a, not a lot of coaching um, because otherwise <clears throat> there wouldn't be this outrageous demand for my services Um in different states around the U.S. And, and here in San Diego. So I know the demand's there. <clears throat> it just needs to be some structures um, put down from the top. Um, but I do not know a hell of a lot about that. Yeah, sure. No, fingers crossed that it does happen because, like you said, the demand's there, so let's just make it happen. You know, that would be fantastic to get uh, the USA cricket team you know, on the same level as you know, some of the international sides. Like, I mean, yeah. imagine 10 years' time, South Africa or New Zealand versus the USA. That would be incredible. And, and yeah, there's potential to make that happen, I'm sure. And um, on that, I know you're still you know, at the right age of 51, I want to say. 31 years old. So. Can you take that hat off? I'm seeing <clears throat> quite a few requests um, to see you here. So would you take a moment <laughs> and take that hat off? Uh, I mean, I don't know. Okay, no worries. <laughs> Look at that boy! Lockdown's treated me well, huh? Oh man, you need me to give you a trip. People have been saying that I'm I'm getting a receding hairline, but I actually think that um my mom and dad gave me these genetics of a really large forehead. Um, yeah, I've just got some massive forehead going on over there, and that that's something that I can't uh, control, unfortunately. So sorry guys, sorry to disappoint. Um, here it is though. Actually, I think it's looking quite good though. But anyway, going back onto the the more important stuff. Um. You're 31 years old. You've uh, played a lot of professional cricket at a very, very high level. Um, what are the chances of Marty Tan representing the USA in the senior level? You reckon that's going to happen? Do you think it's a possibility? I mean, I've, <clears throat> I'm probably hitting more balls than I've ever had in my career because I've got a backyard net. Yeah. Um, look, if if the opportunity came up, then I'd certainly be hungry for that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, obviously I'd have to Prove to selectors, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, if the opportunity was there and, and I've proven myself, then, yeah, for sure, I'd love to play international cricket for US and, and help out in any way I can yeah. um, from cricketing skills and also helping the development with mindset and, and team culture within that team as well. Um, but there's some great cricketers around the US, so certainly I wouldn't be expecting to just roll into that side Um but if perhaps um, there was some interest from the selectors and the coach or whatever, and and I was showing a bit of form, yeah, flipping love to love to play some international cricket for the US. It'd be it'd be a dream come true because I mean, obviously my my goal as a kid was to play cricket for New Zealand, and um, I just gave absolutely everything to that cause, and and it, it, I was happy to walk away knowing, no, nah, I, I couldn't quite get there. Um, perhaps maybe a bit of luck here and there, and it could have worked out, but. I was, it was easy for me to walk away because um, I just gave everything. I tried everything and um, I just couldn't quite crack it. So I was easy to walk away from that. And if, if a second chance came to play international cricket for the US, then, I mean, that would be absolutely outstanding. Yeah, oh boy. Nah, that would be... Honestly, I'm holding fingers, man, crossing fingers for you. I think that would be unbelievable. And I think, you know, I don't know the eligibility rules and all that kind of stuff, but I can't see you not playing because, you know, quality left arm off you. And obviously a good batter as well, which would be incredible. Um, but yeah, honestly, it's um, it's just something that we're gonna have to wait and see, I guess. And uh, you know, I'm I'm sure I speak on behalf of many other people uh, when I say that we really do hope that you do get a gig with uh, with the USA because these videos that we've been watching, you've been looking awesome. You're smashing the ball out of the middle of the bat everywhere you go. It's incredible. Um, but yeah, just want to say, Marty, like 
keep on going with what you're doing on the coaching uh, front. You've been fantastic. Uh, love your content. And um, you're obviously, you know, inspiring a lot of young cricketers out there. And it's, it's great to see. And I think we need more people like this to, to spread um, the kind of word of the game and, and just keep cricket growing. And uh, the fact that you're doing it in America makes it even more special. So um, thanks for sharing today, bud. It's been uh, really, really good. Um, I don't know if we've got any questions over here. I think we've just got a lot of abuse about my lid. Um, <laughs> irrelevant stuff. Uh yeah, I've got it. Actually, you know what? To sign off, let's let's have a look at your lid. It's pretty nice. Oh boy! You can see there. Did it myself. It's, it's come. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I mean, are you? And, and I want to see the. I want to see the ID because I'm not convinced you're 31. You look about maybe 73 on a good day. Um, <laughs> Grandpa came. There's nothing fresher than my haircut, and I'm actually looking at opening a um, hair salon on on base here as well. So you can come get your haircut, and then hit some balls. Oh boy, I mean, I that is literally a plan of mine. I'd, I'd love to come visit you really, really soon. Obviously, let's wait for this lockdown to end. Um, but that would be quality. Um, bit of a session in the back uh, back garden in the nest. That would be unreal, boy. But um, yeah. Cheers, big guy. It's been awesome. Um, thanks for sharing everything and uh, all the very best for the future and we'll definitely keep in touch, bud. Pleasure, mate. You're doing a great job over there and uh, get in behind uh, cricket excellence um, cricket. and keep up the good work, mate. Hopefully soon, soon you can go uh, do some real training with some kids and stuff when things open back up. That's it, boy. Awesome. Cheers, buddy. I'll see you later. Catch you, boy. Cheers, cheers. Catch you.